It's time to explore wrestling's past and potential future with your weekly dose of a segment we call What If? Only found here on the WWE Podcast. Hey guys, welcome to the WWE Podcast. We have a great What If segment tonight with Anthony DeMarco covering What If Kurt Angle Never Left WWE. He left in 2006, but we cover what his career would have looked like, who his opponents could have been, how his career may have ended, and dive into so much more. But before we get to that, I just want to let you know that tomorrow night, tomorrow night on an app called Wisdom, go download it. It's free. Yes. Uh, I will be going live, and it's going to be at 830 Eastern tomorrow night, Tuesday, November 30th at 830 Eastern time. I'll be going live and I'll put the show, uh, the the link to my wisdom, or rather the link to my wisdom profile is going to be going into the description of this show. So if you're not sure how to get to me, check out the description in this show. It's super easy. I mean, my username is at WWE Podcast, so kind of consistent with uh, everything else that I have social media wise. So uh, check out at WWE Podcast. I'm going to be going, going live. And why am I going to be going live? It's not video. It's audio. But I'll be going live to take your questions and be able to talk with you guys. But the main purpose of it is for me to share a little bit of how we arrived here on the WWE, WWE Podcast and maybe give you guys a little bit of inspiration or pun intended wisdom that I didn't get when I started out a podcast. And if you're looking to start your own show, start your own business even. You could apply these to that. I'm not a know-it-all. I'm not an expert, but I've been through a lot of stuff. I've been through a lot of the trial and error, a lot of mistakes I made along the way that I wish I had somebody to guide me and use as a a kind of a, a, a compass of where I'm going. And so check me out tomorrow night. I'm going to be going live at 8.30 Eastern time, Tuesday, November 30th, um, Again, my profile is at WWE Podcast, so check that out. And I'll be I'd love to take your questions, of course. And I'll go, um, I'll go as long as we need to on that show, and uh, it'll be fun. So check me out there. All right, well, let's get to Anthony DeMarco and myself talking about the what if of the week because that's why you're here. So let's get to that. And of course, tomorrow night I'll be covering the Monday Night Raw review. Wednesday will be the mailbag, and then. The rest of the schedule is what it is. What it is, Mimi Burris is back. So, guys, strap in. Wrestling is back. We're about to crank right into into December already. Believe it or not, it's December in just a couple days. So, guys, I'll be talking to you tomorrow. And until then, take care. What if Kurt Angle did not leave the WWE in 2006? What would that have looked like for his career? What opponents would he have faced? What did he miss? Was it the right choice? Today, we've got Anthony DeMarco, of course, as always, to join us in discussing this topic and diving a little bit deep into it. So, Anthony, welcome to the show. Great topic. Yeah, man, I'm looking forward to get into this. And like I was touching on right before we start recording here, is that watching the Ruthless Aggression series that, you know, on a quick side note, arguably the best series that the network has come out with as a whole. And that's saying something given the Monday Night Wars, the Last Ride series and all that. But watching that series, you realize how big and how much of a crucial role Kurt Angle played into it. And his abrupt departure from the company in 2006 was one of the more shocking ones in that time and really felt like it came out left field and kind of legitimized the TNA slash Impact Wrestling product. And I can't help but feel like would we have remembered Kurt Angle more fondly had he stuck around through the tail end of the Ruthless Aggression era and so on into the PG era? Yeah, that's that, that, that's right. I mean, I, I think the answer to that is yes. And I do remember in 06, while it seems like a lifetime ago, and, and for all intents and purposes, for most of us, it was, uh, we had Kurt Angle leaving and really one of the biggest moves, you know, post WCW, of course, once WCW was bought by WWE, there was essentially no more competition. Yes, TNA was around, but this was the biggest move post, I think, the WCW uh, dissolution where we had a WWE talent, the caliber of Kurt Angle, make a move to W or uh, to TNA 
and joining Dixie Carter and everyone else there and really, like you said, legitimizing the brand with one single move uh, from from the stature and everything that Kurt Angle brought to the table and everything, all the reputation that he had and created in WWE, transferring that to TNA was a big, big deal. And I mean, I remember even watching an interview and I don't know who conducted it. It was a, it was an actual one. It wasn't like a TMZ one. He caught up with the airport or something. And Kurt Angle had said that the reasoning for him leaving and take this for what it's worth, of course. But at the time he said that he was looking around the locker room and saying to himself, you know, what else can I do here? Who have I not faced? Um, you know, so I think he felt a little bit like he had been around the horn. He didn't have much left to prove, much left to do in WWE at the time. Of course, WWE was just about to make its transition to PG. We're, we're coming up on that uh, in, in, in 06. But, yeah, I mean, that was the reasoning Kurt Angle gave. So uh, did you did you see that interview? Maybe it, it was like a I don't know. He was outside doing the interview with somebody. It might have been like a. I don't know. I'm not really sure who it was. I'd have to look it up on YouTube, but that's the reasoning he gave in 06. Well, I had heard that as well, but one thing that seemed to stick out is that he was unhappy with his placement in the company and that he needed more time off. And he spoke about that quite candidly on the Broken Skull sessions as well. And I think when they moved him to the ECW brand for the inaugural launch of that brand on Tuesday nights is kind of what was the straw that broke the camel's back for him. And people forget that, but he was like the big time WWE guy that shifted over to the ECW brand when they tried to debut that on uh, on an equal plane with Raw and SmackDown. And if I'm to understand it correctly, Kurt Angle was going to be the guy to take the belt off of Raw Van Dam when he got busted with the DUI and had to drop the belt immediately. But because Angle left and went on to the big show, who had a lengthy run with the ECW championship in the last half of 06. And I think that Angle going to the ECW brand maybe had him thinking about like, yeah, well, what else is there left for me to do here besides be the guy? And there's that, I guess, infamous clip of him in the WWE locker room out of character watching a Cena match and acknowledging, like, this guy's got it, this guy's going to make it big. And then he said in another recent interview that at that moment he kind of realized that Cena was taking the, the top dog spot. And the thing is, is that Kurt Angle during the Ruthless Aggression Era 03, 04 as well, you could have made the case that he was vying for that top spot at the top of the food chain in the company parallel with Brock Lesnar. And they had arguably the best storyline in all of 2003, main eventing WrestleMania 19. So I think it was couple, it was a kind of twofold. On one hand, you had Angle who wasn't satisfied with his position in the company and wanted time off and also probably felt that he had done it all, especially that they had now put him on the ECW brand. Yeah, I had forgotten about the ECW deal um, with really just one of the worst uh, reincarnations of anything that they've tried to do in, in recent memory. I mean, it's it's it was just a bad idea from the beginning. You knew even on paper it wasn't a good idea, much less trying to do an execution. It was bad. And uh, I can absolutely understand Kurt Angle's frustration for somebody that he where he felt he should have been here and WWE felt that he was here. I think that that mismatch absolutely contributed to him and his desire to get the hell out of there. Um, you know, he had made uh, his money, of course, and Dixie Carter and uh, in TNA at the time was a little bit more of a financially stable organization than they are today. But um, yeah, at the time, that was absolutely a contributing factor. Obviously, injury, time off, all of that. And uh, absolutely one of the uh, greatest of all time that we saw leave in 2006. So um, I, I guess... I'm trying to figure out where to start. I mean, we, we, we look at 06. We look at his current status. He's still in, uh, in, in, in 06, he was in ECW, right? Like that's when they actually tried to transition him into ECW was 06. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Starting at the one night Sam pay-per-view. So, right. Okay. That's right. Oh, in the, uh, Hammerstein ballroom, right? I believe. Um, exactly. Oh God. Uh, that's a, that's a show in and of itself. But, uh, so in that time frame, if, he had decided to stay with WWE. What do you think would have been his initial next program, or at least one of the next big ones on his plate in 2006 and even into 2007? Do you have any idea of potentially who he could have been working with at that time? Well, I 
transplant myself back into that era and specifically what was going on in ECW. Obviously, we know that Rob Van Dam was the first ever ECW champion in the new rebirth version of the product and the brand. And then he quickly dropped it to the big show because in you know real life, he got busted with the DUI and, the, and he got suspended for 30 days. So right off the bat, you had a guy in Rob Van Dam who was supposed to be the face, the top baby face on the ECW brand removed from the product. And he never really kind of recovered from that either. So I think that you would have had Kurt Angle pushed as the top baby face on the ECW brand and probably would have had a lengthy program with the big show spilling all the way into the new year. Because you kind of look at what they did to kind of make up for Kurt Angle leaving and the events that surrounded Rob Van Dam. And they slid Bobby Lashley over to the ECW, um, the brand, and he, they kind of gave him almost like a premature push with the ECW championship. I don't think it was a fail by any means, but I think it would have been more significant and would have given the brand more legitimacy had it been a guy like Kurt Angle, who at that point was one of the elder statesmen of the WWE roster. So I think you would have had him eventually defeat the Big Show for the ECW Championship and more likely than not take in the ECW Championship to its very first WrestleMania at WrestleMania 23. Maybe he has a one-on-one -on -one match with Bobby Lashley for the championship. Maybe they find a way to get him against Cena, either for the WWE title or the ECW title in some form or fashion. But I think that would have been the initial run you would have seen of Kurt Angle in the first, let's say, eight to nine months had he stayed with the company. There's no doubt that probably would have been the path that he was going to take if he had stayed. And, you know, barring any injury, of course, that seems like a logical next step for Kurt Angle. And, you know, when you, when you continue to kind of play this out, of course, you don't know how long he actually would have lasted given his injury, given all the wear and tear on his body that was just absolutely inhuman, the amount of wear and tear, not to mention the, the Olympics, of course, that takes enough out of you to, to you know, for, for a lifetime, much less getting into WWE and throwing your body at the ground every night. Um, I, I think that beyond that time frame, you know, we, we can project out how far we think he would have made it. Maybe we'll do that in a few minutes. But in terms of the programs that he could have potentially worked with the people he could have potentially worked with before we talk about a, po a possible end date for him. I mean, I look at a guy like even Alberto Del Rio. I mean, a guy like that, that I know that he came in a little bit later and he doesn't have the best reputation. I think Alberto Del Rio would have been a nice, uh, a nice guy to work with. You also take a look at, dare I say, you know, CM Punk. I mean, CM Punk was a guy that in the straight edge society was, I think uh, one of the more most underutilized groups in all of WWE, I think maybe he could have even joined that group. I mean, you look at that and say, hey, do you think that Kurt Angle could have joined the straight edge society? Or do you think that that maybe not would would have not maybe been a good fit? I don't know. What do you think? Well, it's weird because it, it makes you pose the question, was his character getting a bit stale in WWE? And I know that he had gone from baby face to heel a few times. But the character was always predominantly the same, you know, former gold medalist, Olympic athlete, American hero, all that. And going to a group like the Straight Edge Society, I think it would have been like a complete 180 for him. I think it would have been interesting, but do I think he would have gotten there? No. And that's not an indictment on Kurt Angle. I think it's more just because Vince did not see the true value in that group. And to your point, it was one of the more underutilized groups in WWE in the early years of the PG era. And their biggest claim to fame was what? The program with Rey Mysterio, if I remember correctly? Yeah, yeah. I think that is. And imagine if it had been involved with Kurt Angle and then maybe he eventually turns and joins. But I just feel that Vince and Creative never looked uh, at the, at the um, Straight Edge Society too highly and unfortunately i think it would have kept kurt angle away from them but when i think about his possible opponents i think a, a slam dunk would have been him versus cena at a wrestlemania the fact that they never crossed paths upon angle's return in 2017 is kind of a shame i know kurt angle was a shell of a for, of him of his former self in terms of in-ring capabilities but i still think that's something that most people would have wanted to see i think him versus sheamus would have been cool just because sheamus is such a stiff worker and a physical guy and i think that plays right into the way angle used to wrestle back then as well maybe a, a lengthy program between him and 
Randy Orton. I know they were involved in the triple threat match at WrestleMania 22, but that was more about Rey Mysterio, Mysterio as opposed to them too. So those are some quick guys that I think could have faced off against the angle. What about you? Yeah, the guy, John Cena was on my list, my, my little list I made here of – of opponents and we people may say well wait a minute they faced each other before yeah they have but not the john cena that evolved into the you know late 2000s into the early 2010s that's the 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 john cena that we wanted to see kurt angle face now of course at that time we don't know how much more mileage or wear and tear would have been on kurt's body this is all just assuming that he was physically capable of doing so but there is a difference between you know mid 2000s john cena and late 2000s and early 2010s john cena and that to me would have been a lot more entertaining and yes the whole 2017 return everybody wanted john cena kurt angle to end his career everybody nobody wanted corbin nobody in this in their right minds wanted corbin uh, and honestly, they're not even you notice know, Corbin's not even talking about it. I mean, you have a, a career win like that to beat a legend like Kurt Angle and retire him at WrestleMania. And they haven't even mentioned it once, like at all. And you would think that that would be something he would harp on as a heel over and over and over to get under people's skin. But they just let it die. So really, there was it was like the most pointless <laughs> matchup of all time for Kurt Angle. But that that said, yeah, John Cena and Kurt Angle would have been and should have been the the uh, match for Kurt at that time. Although prior or uh, post that, uh, Kurt has come out and said that he wanted WWE to put him in matches, you know, several months in advance to get his body ready to get his body loosened up. I mean, he had a whole bunch of arthritis and problems like that. So he said that not being in ring kind of seized up his joints and he wasn't, you know, he wasn't using them the way that he normally did. So by the time they actually let him get back to the ring, he didn't look very good. He looked like, you know, like you said, a shell of himself because it's partially WWE's fault that they didn't allow him enough time to prepare. So, um, yeah, but that's obviously in the past. I don't think we'll ever see another Kurt Angle match again. I mean, I think that pretty much goes without saying in WWE. And, um, you know, but again, the other guys, as I go back, of who he could have faced, I mean, Daniel Bryan, maybe, right? Like, what about, yeah, Daniel, you know, Daniel time. Bryan, I think, would have been, I mean, geez, you talk about a dream matchup if those two were in their prime. Holy, I mean, does it does it get better for a WrestleMania main event than Kurt Angle versus Daniel Bryan? Imagine that 20-minute uh, matchup. My God. Yeah, Kurt Angle was those kind of guys that you could put in there with a broomstick. <laughs> like, I can't think of a match off the top of my head that Kurt Angle performed badly in. And you think about all the lengthy programs he had over the years with, like, Stone Cold Steve Austin, The Rock, John Cena, Eddie Guerrero, Chris Benoit... I mean, Shawn Michaels won the best WrestleMania matches of all time at WrestleMania 21. He is a guy that I think a lot of the newer audience don't really get to appreciate how good he was. Because if we're being honest here, when he came back in 2017 and 18, he was just, uh, it was kind of sad to watch, to be frank with you. But I think that had he stuck around, let's say, right until 2012, I would assume he would have followed the kind of Triple H rock trajectory in terms of when they would have stopped wrestling on a somewhat uh, consistent basis. I think we would have remembered him more fondly, like The Rock, like Triple H. And I think that with Kurt Angle, he's the kind of guy that he did his business talking in the ring, if I worded that poorly, but you know what I'm saying. Yep. And I think when he would have become kind of like the elder statesman. And he was almost there, if not already, in 2006. But imagine him in 2009 on the same level as the likes of Taker and Triple H. I just think that people would have seen him in a different capacity. Because my next question to you was, in Ruthless Aggression to you, was he ever one of the faces of the company, if not the face? Uh, as far as uh, Kurt Angle, was he ever the face? Um, I think that he was one of. I, th I mean, I still think when you look at the Ruthless Aggression era, you know, obviously Rock and Austin had faded into the background. Of course, they'd make their returns here and there, but they were no longer mainstays and constants. Uh, I think Brock Lesnar was at the forefront. Eddie Guerrero was at the forefront. Uh, Kurt Angle, again, was at the forefront. But I, I don't think while he was one of those top, top, top guys, it wasn't like when Austin and Rock were there and they were – they were in a tier that is almost never visited where 
there's the top tier guys and then there's the elites, like the people that the performers that are once in a generation, once in a lifetime legends. And while Kurt was one of the best of all time in the ring, he never quite reached the, the level of Stone Cold or The Rock. I mean, he just didn't. That's how popular and how just once in a lifetime The Rock and Austin were, even Undertaker. So uh, to, to your to your question, I think he was one of the faces, but it's not like he was the dominant you know, the, the must see got to turn on the TV to see what Kurt Angle's doing this week. Oh my God. Well, he was a contributing factor. He had excellent matches with everybody. There's nothing bad I can say about him, but was he the face? He was one of, but Brock Lesnar burst onto the scene so quickly and people were hungry for that next big thing, ironically. And they got that next big thing with Paul Heyman in 2002. Of course, Brock leaves in 04 to return in 2011 or return in 2012 rather. And so he was one of, he was one of those faces, but you had Shawn Michaels, you had John Cena and Kurt Angle was one of, but not the guy. If you, if that makes sense. It does because one thing about Kurt Angle is that I wonder, because we've been talking about, you know, all the good things that would have happened if he stayed, but on the flip side of that, you can make the argument, like I said earlier in the show, that his character was growing a bit stale. And even though you would switch him from, you know, baby face to heel, and then you went at the tail end, he adopted the wrestling machine gimmick, which is more of a vicious side of him. It was always rooted back to the same thing. And I know most wrestlers always have keep that main common denominator type of trait of them. But Kurt Angle was like especially the same character right through. Never changed his theme song until he got to ECW, ironically, where they modified it a bit. Never changed his ring gear. Kind of always did the same shtick on the mic. Do you think there would have been kind of a risk, uh, like a law of diminishing returns, had he stuck around and persisted with that gimmick? Yeah. Uh, I mean, not just the diminishing returns of his gimmick, but his body. I mean, Kurt is one of those guys that he doesn't know when to, 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 to go. I mean, he doesn't know any other gear other than fifth gear. Like, he is a guy that will drive his body into the ground, literally. And that we would have seen not just a, a diminishing return of character, but also of in-ring performance. And, and, you know, obviously we saw the manifestation of that in 2018 uh, when he faced uh, Baron Corbin, you know, in, in a match that nobody wanted. But uh, do I think it would have been that bad? I, I don't know. I mean, that's why I would have advocated for Kurt Angle to take off like a year if WWE would have given him that time, which is one of the reasons that he left one of then I think it would have done him some real good where he could have gone to maybe 2011, 2012, if he had a much more part-time schedule, if he didn't drive, uh, you know, his body into the ground of doing, you know, house shows and doing you know, wrestling five, six nights a week. And like, he would have had to manage the mileage much more rationally going into the tail end of his career, really from probably 08 to, to 2011, 2012, if he wanted to go that far, I think he would have had to just tone it down, wrestle only when he needs to, only on TVs or pay-per-views, or maybe do kind of a Brock Lesnar schedule to, to elongate his career while at the same time, you know, being able to still be a, a guy on the roster that you know can perform at a high level and not embarrass himself. But the problem is when you are – an Olympic athlete in wrestling, people don't understand how difficult actual amateur wrestling is. It is one of the most exhausting, most physically demanding, mentally demanding sports that have ever existed. When you are you 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 like program your mind to that training and you dedicate yourself for years to that training, it becomes a part of who you are. And so I'm, I have a fear that Kurt probably would have driven himself into the ground and not wanted to take time off. Uh, or at least the length of time he would need it to keep his career going for that long. It's crazy because he lasted on a full-time basis with TNA just up until what year, give or take? Oh, boy. Um, that is, I never watched TNA. <laughs> I mean, I, mean I, saw, yeah, exactly. I said, yeah, see, this is why, that's why I have the WWE podcast. This isn't the wrestling podcast. Uh, mm -hmm. so <laughs> that's how I, th th that's my expertise is, uh, is WWE. But I mean, I'm sure somebody out there could Google it. I, I don't know. I don't know how long from a full-time perspective he lasted it from, 
I mean, I used to, we all did. We, we looked at the big wrestling websites. We'd see the news of, you know, Kurt Angle versus uh, whoever he was facing over there in, in TNA. And we'd see the results and we'd watch a little bit of his clips. And I remember watching and looking at some of the video and, and seeing some of the, the photos. And I'm like, man, he seems like he's really, looks like he's dropping a lot of weight to an unhealthy yeah, point. Got yeah, like that's what I remember seeing was. This guy is dropping weight, not to get lean and, 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 you know, in a healthy way. It looked unhealthy. That's what I visually remember at that time when he went to TNA or those those flash images that I'd get. Well, I'm confident that he went until at least 2011, 2012. I'm confident in saying that. And if I'm wrong, you know, shoot me. But, <laughs> um, and he kind of followed the same timeline as guys like HBK. Well, not so much HBK, but Taker and Triple H. And I always kind of group Triple H, HBK, and Taker together because they're three guys who were prominent figures in the Attitude Era, the Ruthless Aggression Era, and the PG Era. At one point or another, all three of those guys main evented a show in all three of those eras. And I kind of put that group of wrestlers right underneath the Rock and Austins and Hogan's of the world. So had Kurt Angle stuck around and continued to be a main eventer in the PG era like he was in the Ruthless Aggression and Attitude era, would you have been comfortable nowadays grouping him in with Triple H, Taker, and HBK? And I guess the second part of that question is how do you actually view him in today's standards? Hmm. I mean, I, I don't have a problem putting him in today's uh, with that grouping right now, even though he didn't stick around. I mean, I know that he, he wasn't around, for obviously, from, uh, you know, the middle of 06 to, you know, he when his return in, in 2017. But, I mean, um, he is he's in the conversation for one of the best of all time. I mean, that that is also how I view him today. Yes, he didn't stick around for, you know, uh, that that 10 year period, give or take. And yes, I think that he could have even made his career greater. But as we alluded to a few minutes ago, maybe there was a point and they, maybe it would have happened if he stuck around. People would have started to resent him and saying, OK, Kurt, like it's time to hang it up. Stop embarrassing yourself. Or, you know, like you said, the character would have reached a point of where we don't even know what to do with you next. As great as you are, we don't know what to do because eventually you're going to run out of ideas, run out of opponents and run out of of creative to give you. I mean, that's just that's just the way it's going to go. So. Um, given everything that's happened right uh, to this point in reality and not pretending he stuck around, I think that he is still to me to this day, one of the greatest of all time. And I, I oftentimes have to go back and watch some of his matches to remember how effing good he was. The Kurt or the HBK match, one of his best of all time, the match he had with Brock Lesnar at 19. Um, really, unfortunately that's going to be remembered for the Brock Lesnar almost killing himself spot, which is unfortunate because they had a, a decent match, even though Kurt had a broken neck during that match. Um, you know, Kurt, with the, the matches he had with Chris Benoit, the matches he had with Eddie Guerrero, my God, you talk about a wrestling, like a wrestling dream. Those were matches that you would never, ever be able to duplicate in today's environment. And because it was it was so focused on the on, on actual wrestling and um, it, it was like almost amateur wrestling. And a lot of those guys had amateur backgrounds, which is what made those matches so damn great. So I still look at him as one of the greatest of all time, and I would really challenge anybody to put anyone else up against him from a wrestling, in-ring, uh, in-ring ability, psychology, uh, physical standpoint, man, uh, being able to get in and out of holds, everything from top to bottom. He's one of the most polished performers that WWE's ever seen. I think the only fair argument that you can make to, against Kurt Angle would be HBK, if we're oh, being completely yes. objective. Yes. I think, and, not to cut you off, I'll, I'll just, I just wanted to say on HBK, you're right. I think from, um, from a showmanship and character standpoint, I think HBK was a little bit more solid with that. And again, that's not any slight on current angle, but I think HBK, when and you look at the whole of professional wrestling is probably a name higher on most people's lists than current angle because HBK, I think understood the professional wrestling side of it a little, the selling part of it a little bit more than Kurt Angle did. And again, that's no slight on Kurt, but I think that's why you, you could make an argument. Yes, go ahead. Well, it's crazy. And this is kind of like taking it in, in a different direction, but with wrestling, you know how it is. Mm -hmm. I was watching the 2001 Survivor Series um, just yesterday, actually, with a buddy and the five on five match team alliance for team WWF. 
And we were joking because, you know, Kurt Angle, Steve Austin, Shane McMahon, they were all on Team Alliance. <laughs> we were saying, you know, the only true WCW guy on that team was Booker T. But then we started kicking around the possibilities, like if the Alliance angle was done as it should have been. And we've talked about that before, and I think we agreed that Team WCW would have been the three members of the NWO, Goldberg and Sting, correct? Oh, yeah, 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 absolutely. And on WWF, you would have had Rock Austin, Taker, and Triple H as shoe-ins during that time? Yeah, it, yeah. It, it, obviously Triple H was injured, unfortunately, during that whole thing, yes. But ideally, yes. he would have been a shoe-in. In, in a perfect world, yes. And the fifth guy, I mean, there aren't really wrong answers. Unfortunately, HBK wasn't around during that time. You could have had Big Show and whatnot. But I think that Kurt Angle would have been the proper guy to kind of edge out, I would say, Kane and Chris Jericho just barely. But I think Kurt Angle would have been the deserving guy to round out Team WWF, even if the WCW guys had come over right away. And that's saying something, given the other star power available in the Attitude Era to WWF. Guys like The Big Show, guys like Kane, Jericho, Chris Benoit at the time, although I think he was injured as well, Eddie Guerrero. So I think it speaks volumes that after those four other megastars, Angle's probably the next guy in line. And imagine a guy with that type of lineage carrying over all the way into the PG era. It's like, so for you, do you think he would have been the fifth guy to round out Team WWF in an ideal uh, match? You, you can't go wrong. I mean, he even, I believe, uh, when Austin went heel and then he went back to babyface just to turn again to try to double down on his heel turn, which still didn't work and, and be the leader of the alliance, uh, Kurt Angle. I, I believe was the one who eventually won the whole thing for the WWF. I believe in the final matchup, which might, it, was it invasion or was I forget the name. What was the name of that pay-per-view where it, well, it was, was the uh, ultimate winner? Well, what I, what ended up happening, closing out that entire program is that it culminated at survivor series 2001. Oh, okay. okay. Yep. And angle was on team Alliance alongside Austin but it came down to Rock and Austin, and Angle ran in and hit Austin with the title belt Got it. and turned to help WWF win. So it was a big push for Kurt Angle. Okay, yes, yes, yes. I mean, I mean having him, of course, on any team, for any reason at all, For I mean, he is he's a elite, top-tier guy. And yes, he still may not be as big of a name, household name, as Austin, as Rock, as Taker, even Triple H, for that matter. But you can't go wrong with Kurt Angle, and... For him, and I remember that now that you, you spell it out for me, it is playing in my head. And I just remember him coming out on Raw and saying, you know, you guys should be praising me. I'm the one that, uh, you know, saved this company or something like that, trying to take all the praise. Even though he was the guy that saved the WWF, he was also now turning heel uh, by trying to get people to, you know, uh, I guess, bloat his ego. But uh, Kurt Angle, man, yeah. Uh, I'm, now I'm gonna have to go back and watch that Survivor Series because I have, uh, I have, I need to to see how that all went down from elimination to elimination. But hell yeah, Kurt Angle on that team, you know, absolutely. And and uh, I just wish Triple H was there too. But yeah, yeah, 100. percent And before we close it out, a quick non-Kurt Angle question for you, or just kind of rant, is that, and it was actually my buddy who pointed out, is like. For their, all the lack of the WCW guys at that time in the evasion angle, why the hell did they not put the Big Show over on that team? <laughs> Could you make sense of that? Uh, you, the Big Show over on the team WW, oh, WCW. Yeah, exactly. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, that, I never even thought of that. Because at that point, I'm, I, if I'm mistaken... Big Show came in as Paul White in the St. Valentine's Day Massacre between Austin and uh, McMahon as the in, exactly. in the steel cage match. Uh, and from that time, I mean, that, that gave him a couple years to be really transitioned into a WWF guy and get that WCW label off of him. So maybe they felt that it wasn't worth him going back to WCW if the fans had kind of viewed him. And they did all that work to, to, to make him a WWF guy. Uh, to to just have him go back to and undo all of that that work uh, that apparently they had had uh, had done and maybe that's the reasoning but I never even thought about that I never well, even I, yeah 
I'm just bringing it up because, you know, he was drowned behind all the WWF talent. Even with Austin on the Team Alliance and Triple H out of the picture, you saw Rock in front of him, Undertaker in front of him, Jericho in front of him. Angle was flipping and flopping between teams at that point. You had Kane. And it would have just made sense to kind of give Big Show a push and send him over to Team WCW where he started. And I know that they had made an effort to try and rebrand him as a WWF guy. But just from the sheer standpoint of that, they just didn't have any talent for that side. Like, for God's sake, Shane McMahon made Team Alliance. And I'm as big a Shane McMahon uh, fan you can find, but there's no way that he should be in that match. So I don't know. I just thought it would have been a good opportunity to give Big Show a chance to, you know, be on like a high stage. Oh, yeah, definitely. And, you know, I, I, I was Big Show. I, I don't really talk about Big Show on this show. I really don't. And it's not out of disrespect. It's just for some reason he never really comes up because he's not really he's not performing anymore for all intents and purposes. He does things here and there in AEW. And I know that uh, with QT Marshall and, and others. But I think that uh you, you could have easily transitioned him back to, to WCW. It, it seems almost like it's a, a shoe in to do and, and why they didn't do it. I, you know, like you said, it could have been the lack of star power that they, they perceived at that time. But my God, look at the roster. I, I really don't know. And, and like you said, it would have been a good, also a good opportunity to help elevate his career to that next level. Maybe he had backstage heat. Maybe there were things going on that we don't know about. Um, you know, th- that's the only thing I can think about. But, uh, one question for you, and then we'll close this out too, is, uh, Given that Brock Lesnar returned to WWE in 2012, and we had projected that Kurt would have lasted pretty close to that time, albeit a much more limited schedule as the years went on, do you or would you have even been interested in in this fantasy world of maybe having uh, Kurt Angle and Brock Lesnar be Kurt's final match in 2012? Now, I know he debuted, I believe, the night after WrestleMania when the uh, John Cena lost to The Rock. Uh, but if they were able to bring him back before then and maybe close it out at that WrestleMania, I think it was 27, would you have wanted Kurt Angle versus Brock Lesnar at that point if it was physically possible? Or like how, how would you have viewed that potential matchup as Kurt's final as Brock comes back to the company? If it was the old Kurt Angle, then yes, 100%. You could make the case – that that is Kurt Angle's best rival of all time and also Brock Lesnar's greatest rival of all time. I think their rivalry in 2003 is one of the most underrated in the history of WWE and really carried the the company as a whole, I find, not just SmackDown, but Raw, uh, not, yeah, Raw as well, because Raw was kind of floundering during that time with Austin and Rock not on that show. So I think 100% it would have been great to put a bow on Kurt Angle's career, even more so than John Cena. Brock would have been the perfect guy. But it would have had to be in 2012 when Kurt Angle could still go like he used to. Because Kurt Angle in 2019, that version, I would have just actually been scared for his well-being in the in the ring with Brock. So as long as it was the old Kurt Angle, for sure, I would have loved to see that. And it would have, we're talking also from 2019 to, uh, to 2012. That's seven years. I mean, again, if it was a managed schedule and he was at the point where he's like, I can give you one more good one and he was physically ready, mentally okay. I would have, I would also think it would have been very poetic because their, uh, their, their match obviously in 2003 at WrestleMania 19 saw Brock Lesnar going over. This one also would have saw Brock Lesnar going over and maybe a show of mutual respect. At the end of that matchup, nine years later, I think it would have been very poetic, and I, I would have really loved to have seen that. Again, we're, we're projecting out things that are probably, you know, even if Kurt had stayed, I don't know if he would have been able to make it that far. But I think that, that it's something that at least would have been feasible if he stuck around and was WWE for life. So uh, anything else before we uh, put a bow on this? No, I just I just think it's good that we're covering this because I do think all in all he is is one of the more underappreciated guys probably in the history of the company. And I think time isn't really helping because as time goes on we tend to forget all of these great stars of the past and I is an, especially as a new generation comes in and new fans are born that they don't know how good of a performer that Kurt Angle was. People don't get it until you see it and you're like, "Whoa." Like, this guy's the real freaking deal, and uh, I think that everybody who has not seen Kurt Angle work, or at least if it's been a long time, go back and refresh yourself and go just remind yourself of how good this guy was, how much he contributed, 
uh, especially during the ruthless aggression era and how many great moments he gave us. So absolutely. This is a, this was a, a really good topic guys. Just so you know, too, like Anthony's the brains behind all this. Like I very rarely come <laughs> up with ideas. Like most of the time it's, it's him. So you, you guys can thank him for coming up with all of these. What ifs, you know, once in a while I'll come up with the gym, but most of the time uh, it's all Anthony. So, uh, yeah, of course, let everyone know where they can find you. And we all know you do your rivalry show too. That comes out uh, every Friday. Yeah, so as you just said, every Friday my rivalry show drops. Last week was Charlotte versus Becky, a rivalry that is most likely far from over. And on Twitter, you can get me at AdenMarco25. Very good, very good. Well, Anthony, thanks as always, and you have a good night, and we will be talking next week. Yeah, man, talk soon. All right, bye.